Good morning and welcome to the third day of the Animal Law Conference. Um, I'd like to start by extending a special thanks to our gold sponsor, Beyond Meat, um, for sponsoring this Emerging Topics in Animal Advocacy panel. Uh, my name is Raj Reddy and I direct the Animal Law Program at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School. And it's my pleasure to serve as both the moderator of and a presenter on this panel. Let me also take a moment to note that, our, that two of our speakers are joining us remotely. Um, the Animal Law Conference has been approved for 15 CLE credits, including one ethics credit, ethics credit by the California State Bar Association. Um, conference organizers will be in touch via email after the conference uh, with information for attorneys to secure those credits. Um, California attorneys in particular, be sure to stop by the registration table during the conference weekend to sign the CA um, MCLE attendance record. Um, in terms of the order and topics of the presentations themselves, um, I'll be speaking to the nascent uh, fields of insect law and advocacy. Uh, following me will be Professor Jennifer Jaquette of the University of Miami Department of Environmental Science and Policy. Uh, from here and joining us remotely to address the critical need for and gains made to advance protections for shrimps is Andres Jimenez Zoria, uh, CEO of the Shrimp Welfare Project. Uh, last and also presenting virtually is Professor Jeff Zebo, Director of NYU's Animal Studies MA program, as well as its Mind, Ethics, and Policy program, and who will be also be shedding light on the intersection uh, of AI and animal welfare. Um, so with that said, I'd got, like to go ahead and segue into uh, my own presentation by recalling and reflecting on the title of our panel and Observing that I'm pleased to note that I've had the pleasure of teaching this fall at Lewis and Clark, the world's first insect law course, as part of our Emerging Topics in Animal Law series. And it's on this note that um, I'd also like to touch upon the title of my talk itself, Emergence. Um, and as a lawyer and as an academic who works intimately with language that is negotiating, massaging, tangling with, and even at times trying to subvert the plain meaning of words, um, I can't think of a more fitting subject for an emerging topic or frontier than insects. Because when we think about what it means to emerge, the beings who come to mind, that is who come to light, are insects who experience emergence, not just birth, but rebirth over the course of their lives. With these recombinations, having given rise over the millennia to the most diverse tapestry of life as we know it. Yet there's so very little that we actually do know about them. With the mere 900,000 of an estimated 30 million insect species having been documented to date. And with an estimated 10 quintillion, that is 10 million, million, millions alive today. But therein lies a problem, I think. For insects are so small that we often lack the capacity and so numerous that we lack the inclination to appreciate their diversity, their individuality and intrinsic value. And there are so many of them that even when we can see them, they somehow go overlooked, that is, in comparison to their ostensibly more charismatic vertebrate and even invertebrate counterparts. It was actually the conservationist Edward Wilson who called upon his peers to embrace a new perspective roughly a quarter of a century ago. And the vision that he intended to impart was one of their emergence. If only we would pause to consider invertebrates generally and insects in particular. And what he observed is that if we were to draw a clump of earth out in many parts of the world, we would quite literally be holding the lives of thousands of invertebrates, some visible, many microscopic, others perhaps yet to have been identified in the palms of our hands. And of the insects among them, he noted how they together proved the principal engineers of life sustaining ecosystems, capturing, for example, how in the forests of Central and South America, Leafcutter ants industriously harvest vegetation to feed the fungi that they in turn consume, and in doing so, return those vital nutrients that the soil needs to keep those forest ecosystems alive. And though rarely seen, the influence of insects is all around us. From aerating the soil to pollinating fruits, flowers, and crops, from breaking down organic matter 
to constituting the primary food source for others up and across the trophic chain. Comparing them to what are often regarded as keystone species, Wilson observed that if we, humans, were not so impressed by size alone, we'd find an ant more inspiring than a rhinoceros. And today, it's in light of their import that voices have begun to echo Wilson's call to protect these beings, whom he referred to as the little things that run the world, a world that I've increasingly begun to think of fondly as the insectiverse. Yet it's through the use of insecticides and herbicides, not to mention air, soil, water, noise, and light pollution, the ravages of climate change and our destruction of their habitats that insects are running out of options, out of places to go and be. And the numbers, the numbers back this up. In a nearly three decade long study of our anthropogenic effects, Germany found that its insect populations had dropped by a staggering 75%, a statistic revised upwards to 82% when accounting for periods of otherwise peak activity. To turn back to that clump of soil then, it's not so much that insects have been slipping through our fingers, so much as that we humans have been crushing them in hand. And while the need to protect them has grown apparent in recent years, one would be hard pressed to argue that it's for their sake and not ours. If I might draw upon and complicate a tenet of chaos theory, this now cliche of that butterfly beating her wings in China and causing a tornado here in California, the real chaos we're coming to learn will result when that butterfly fails to flap her wings at all. And indeed, our anthropocentric world doesn't just happen to overlap here and there with, but rather is coterminous with the insectiverse. And insects, who've managed to survive all five mass extinction events to date, don't need us in it. It's we who need them, the insects. Pivoting beyond conservation, what's also emerged is that insects are not the hive-minded robots in miniature that scientists and society at large once believed them to be. Indeed, studies such as this one illustrate that insects such as juvenile bumblebees engage in intrinsic play. Others have found that ants can recognize themselves in mirrors, the implication being that they have a theory of the self, with this measure long having been considered the hallmark of cognition across species. In bees and ants, they aren't the only ones. Numerous studies are helping to build a consensus that insects can and do feel pain, and not just a reflexive nociception-based response to harmful stimuli, but also chronic neuropathic pain, alongside experiences of stress and the physiological effects of depression. And in consideration of these studies, I would introduce us all to the Drosophila, also known as a common fruit fly, who is exploited in quite literally untold numbers and represents one of, if not the most used animal model in science internationally. And like other animals, insects are commodified for use as pets, for exhibition, for fighting, and are also killed, such as cochineal insects in the billions as dyes for food, not to mention in the trillions for food itself, that is as feed for other farmed animals, namely pigs, chickens, and fishes. And not to mention also as food for our own pets, as well as for direct human consumption with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization actively promoting entomophagy or the practice of eating insects as an environmentally responsible answer to combating global food insecurity. And for clothing with silkworms boiled alive in that quiescent pupil state, preventing them from emerging as or realizing their adult or imago form. And it's against this backdrop that I'd like to touch upon just a few conservation and welfare frameworks to illustrate how insects fit or fail to fit into the law, as well as stress as why we as animal advocates must embrace a holistic approach to better securing their protections. And in doing so, I hope to note 
um, I hope to, as noted at the outset, attest to how for so many of us working within the law, words so often fail, confound, and indeed at times can manage to surprise us. So take, for example, the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, which protects all classes of endangered animals, including arthropods, a category that insects like the spotted lanternfly fall into. Yet, in the very next breath, the ESA singles out insects alone for potential listing as pests, who are then afforded no protections if deemed a threat to humans. And we see this general animus against insects in other contexts as well, such as when they're classified as non-native or invasive species. Take, for example, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's campaign against each and every life stage of the spotted lanternfly, with numerous news outlets capturing its thrust with the catchy phrase, see it, squish it. All the more curious and confounding is New York's conservation law, which features two main elements. The first states that New York owns all of the animals in its jurisdiction with a notable qualification for insects alone, who may be the property of the state, but if and only if they are listed as protected. And we might ask why this stipulation about property and ownership? What purpose does it serve? Well, as our second element portrays, the logic of the state's ability or authority to regulate and indeed prevent the killing, taking, and possession of animals lies in its pre-existing ownership of them. And what's so ironic then is that it's unprotected insects alone among all other forms of animal life who escape being classified as legal property, a status that advocates like myself and many of you in the room are striving to lift animals out of. And yet being something other than the inherent property of the state would leave them quite literally by the form of the letter of this law outside of its protections. Shifting to the welfare arena, insects are excluded through a myriad of ways, such as in our Federal Animal Welfare Act, and not by virtue of their taxonomic class, but by their inability to regulate their internal body temperatures. Compare this to state-based anti-cruelty frameworks, such as New Mexico's, which excludes them explicitly, or in my home state of Oregon, where the exclusion is implicit, insects simply aren't named. But do take note of this protection for fishes, um, and I'll turn upon, or I'll touch upon that in a moment. But for now, let me say that other states' laws present even more complex puzzles for us to solve. For example, Minnesota defines animals using all inclusive terms, yet it's questionable whether a court would actually deem insects to be animals for the purposes of enjoying those protections that all other animals receive, allowing, of course, for use specific exceptions. Yet, Minnesota also features use specific protections, such as for animals possessed for one's enjoyment as a pet or companion animal, and who merits in light of this unique relationship that fundamentally focuses on our sentiments added protections with regard to certain harms. And so a, perhaps a court would find that my pet beetle or this atlas moth should qualify if you were to come into my home, see him and squish him, perhaps. But owing again to their emergence and re-emergence, we might also wonder, since our atlet, atlas moth is the same subject of a life here as here, if our court would find that he should be protected for my future or even my present enjoyment while in his larval state. But what about the pupil state in between? Again, perhaps, and perhaps not. And of course, what we as animal advocates must ask is whether elevating the status of insects in the eyes of the law is worth it if it legitimizes or even encourages their captivity. And the answer is, to these questions have stark implications for other forms of life as well. Take, for example, the non-human rights project's habeas corpus case to free an elephant named Happy from the Bronx Zoo based on the argument that she merits certain liberty rights given her status as a self-aware, cognitively complex creature. And how do we know that? Well, as observed by the non-human rights project, Happy was the first elephant to pass the mirror test back in 2005. And although the court's majority determined that she did not merit the granting of habeas, 
Two judges dissented to express views to the contrary and as to their framing of the majority's argument that to do so would open the proverbial floodgates, such as to require a child with an ant farm to defend the confinement of each and every one of those ants, they said, ants simply cannot make the same claims that happy can. And while we certainly do know more about elephants, the fact that ants have passed uh, the mirror test, among others, more than suggests that they have similar, if not equitable, claims to liberty, which the right of habeas corpus at its core is supposed to affirm and protect. And what I wonder, personally, is if what this comes down to in the end is really the charismatic character of a species, a feature, as Wilson reminds us, that's in the eye of the beholder. And what I've come to fear is that insects have always been are, and are increasingly becoming the foils of even progressive court opinions. And yet to include them, if we're speaking in practical terms, would lead to legislative backlash at this point in time. And so I wonder, if not now for insects, when? And if there will be a when, how will it arrive? And how can we help realize that day? And the answer I offer is beginning to take shape in conservation circles, with a notable case having arisen earlier this year right here in California, where the legislature provided that certain animals were to be protected, even at great cost. And regulating these protections fell to the Fish and Game Commission, which defined fish to include species that are not. And it was against this backdrop that advocates called for the listing of bumblebees who are at historic risk but are not, of course, fishes in the plain or scientific meaning of the word. And such was the argument advanced by the almond industry, which would have certainly harmed them as part of their production. Indeed, they said the commission had overstepped its authority in listing them. And I think outside of the context of this case, some or maybe many of us would agree with that sentiment. There's just something, shall we say, fishy about calling insects fishes. But the court sided with the state holding that the term fish does include them. And I would pause here to share my belief that this case was not about what a word means, but of the need to stretch and craft a new meaning from the words that we have, whether in light of the insect crisis, its ecological consequences, the economic value of pollinator species, of which bees and bumblebees are indeed the poster insects of, or perhaps, just perhaps, owing to the numerous studies attesting to their cognitive, social, and other capacities. In its purest sense, what I think the court was calling for was the need to provide for their re-emergence, to help them recover from the harms that we've caused. But what are of other uses and forms of exploitation? And what I think this case affords us is insight into how, even if the letter of the law can't be rewritten yet in this or in other states, meaning that the meaning of the law can and should evolve and adapt and that it's incumbent upon us to see that change through so that perhaps one day in my home state of Oregon, an insect might be regarded as a fish to be equitably protected against acts of cruelty. Or perhaps in a habeas case some years down the line, an ant already more inspiring than a rhinoceros might also be seen as an elephant. And that is until they no longer need to be with my own hope being that one day in the not too distant future, we might see them for what and who they are. And I'd like to suggest in closing that that future has already begun to emerge with Germany just having passed the world's first national insect protection law. And what it provides for among insecticide and herbicide bans are requirements for educational campaigns at all levels of society, as well as the regulation of light pollution so as to lead us into what I offer are brighter days, if only we would dim our own lights a little so that theirs might shine more brightly as re-emergent guiding lights for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here in uh, among people who value, I think, morality more than the market, and it's just uh, becoming increasingly rare. I am going to be talking about octopuses, 
So um, relative to uh, arthropods on land, the, the mollusks of the sea have it, have it easy, I think. Um, many of us are familiar with octopuses already. We don't have to be persuaded of their intelligence or um, curiosity, cognition. So let us begin. Let's see here. Here we go. All right, so many of you in this room are already familiar with precautionary legislation because it's been used, especially in the states, um, for banning new technologies or, um, or egregious technologies like gestation crates. And I'm really excited about precautionary legislation's possibility for um, wild animals, and I count octopus vulgaris still as, as part of that. So I was reading about some cases, again, I'm not a lawyer, um, and so many of you will be more familiar with this than, than I am. But in the 90s, South Carolina, for instance, banned preemptively um, SeaWorld from entering the state when um, they had attempted to. And I thought, oh, you know, that's kind of interesting strategy to sort of ban something before it exists. That, that feels good in light of all the amazingly daunting infrastructure we're trying to undo, both in terms of animals and of course, um, oil and gas. And also I work on um, marine conservation generally, and I was really heartened, and Kathy Hessler spoken about this before, um, the preemptive ban on fishing in the Arctic as a really kind of promising international arrangement um, under the shifting conditions of climate change and what is likely to, to be opening um, areas of the ocean. So when I saw this article published in the conversation by a scientist at the University of Vigo in Spain about um, how octopus farming could be the next big thing, I thought, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we work against this or at least have a conversation before it, it is just sort of inevitably unleashed on the world. So um, you'll see that was in uh, 2014. It takes academics a very long time to do anything. In January 2019, um, we published a, a, an article making the case against octopus farming. And just the way that you in this room are trying to work, I think, with um, not just animal law, but with environmental law, with indigenous law, trying to form coalitions. I was working with an animal welfare scientist, a philosopher, Peter Godfrey Smith, and um, an animal advocate to write this um, to write this article, which was again having a strong normative stance against octopus farming, and we made the claim that octopus farming should not happen on three grounds, um, and you could argue additional grounds if you wanted. But the first, of course, was ecological: that octopuses are carnivores; they're going to put additional pressure on animals, either through having to catch those wild animals from the sea, or even at best substituting those with insect meal or other animal feeds. They are carnivores. And the growth in aquaculture generally has, has been in this unsustainable direction toward more and more species that require feed or other animals um, to be caught again from the ocean or rendered in, in other ways. The other reason um, was that this really wasn't about food security. It wasn't about feeding people who needed to eat. Um, this is a, an industry publication showing that the, the rise in um, demand for our octopus meat generally was the result of increasing incomes, wanting more exotic meats in your diet, uh, things like travel, and the um, impression that octopuses were healthy. Again, it's a uh, high, uh, uh, high value meat. It wasn't about um, feeding uh, the food insecure. And finally, of course, I think what people in this room are most concerned about was that welfare considerations were not being taken into account. And really um, that's true across aquaculture in, in general. We later did a large review led by Becca Franks just showing that um, there are so there's so little known about um, aquatic animal welfare in general, and relative, especially even to terrestrial animals, which we know when we do know, we still aren't doing a good job of implementing it. But we actually know almost nothing about their welfare needs. And in the case of octopus vulgaris or the common octopus, it looks like it would be very difficult to give them anything near what um, 
uh, adequate welfare uh, would require in captivity, especially under the, the pressures of capitalism. And then we were fortunate in the, ne the very next year when everyone was trapped at home, this movie came out, My Octopus Teacher, and um, it explored uh, a relationship between uh, Craig Foster and this octopus in the wild on her terms. And that was a really unique uh, view into the life of octopus vulgaris, the very same species that they're talking about subjecting to mass production captured the heart and minds of people trapped inside watching Netflix because of COVID. And the film, of course, won the Academy Award. And there's a moment in the film when Craig Foster is talking about digging into the scientific literature. And then he's talking about what he finds with regards to personality and other aspects of octopus behavior. But in that moment of the film, I'd say there was a little bit of dishonesty because actually, if you look into Octopus Vulgaris in, the, in Google Scholar or the Web of Science, one of the first things you'll find is about how to farm them. This is where the main investments into knowing them has been. And um, we've been talking about farming them for, um, for decades and we have not succeeded in that or humans have not succeeded in that because of some technological hurdles, which we can get into if you want. So in sum, the octopus farming argument in favor of, of farming rests on the fact that they are very fast growing. They have short lifespans, which is great for food production. You can harvest them at about a year. They're aimed at luxury markets. They'll get a high, uh, high um, value for the meat. It creates jobs. The industry is always mentioning this. Sometimes the industry is saying that it will reduce pressure on wild octopuses or on wild animals generally. And um, that, again, until this point, and until the last couple of years, the farming has been stalled due to the behavior and life characteristics of the octopuses themselves, not because of the social conditions under which these farms would operate. And our argument in response, again, is, is what I just mentioned, the environmental impacts, the food security impacts, the animal impacts, and trying to remove in advance that social license to operate, that these hurdles should not just be technological, but there should be an ethical hurdle to putting another animal into mass production in the 21st century. So we were fortunate with our article that, um, which was published in a, in a pretty obscure um, publication, the popular arm of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, that um, Robin McKay at The Guardian picked it up. And after that, it got uh, a lot more attention, the idea that there was, in fact, opposition to this industry that was um, preparing to launch. And um, wonderfully, Compassion World Farming uh, launched a campaign in 2019 uh, based mainly in Europe, but also working, as you'll see, with, um, with some aspects of the Hawaii farm to stop octopus farming, um, first civil society group to do so. That same year, we um, published an open letter in Animal Sentience with more than 100 um, academics who signed on to a letter that we should not farm octopuses, that they're... Um, that the exceptional behaviors and exceptional intelligence and um, exceptional nature of the animals actually should bestow upon them some moral obligation to not subject them to mass production. And again, there was more media coverage. It's still happening now if you're following this issue at all. But the early coverage like this, um, you can see the one part of the problem is in communicating to people what octopus farming would even look like. The imagery that you see here this to me does not convey any kind of problem. If this is what octopus farming looks like, sign me up. Um, that is not what industrial form of mass production of these animals is going to look like. So we also worked with some artists at NYU who specialize in dystopian algorithmic art, um, which seems really suitable to industrial factory farming, um, to render what a potential octopus farm could, you know, could look like to try to use this in our conversations. And it's um, really necessary at this point to uh, take urgent action on this issue because while in 2014 it was, it was largely hypothetical, now we know that um, Nueva Pescanova has a farm, has a site, is trying to break ground, 
in the Grand Canary Islands, um, a Spanish owned island off of Africa. And a coverage in The Guardian from June 2023 also shows that they're saying, you know, these problems that we had with cannibalism in the lab, they're going away because we are um, selecting for octopuses. They're, they said in this article, they're five generations in, they're selecting for octopuses who are more docile, who don't have these behavioral issues, and they are domesticating, dewilding uh, this, this species. Um, and then you'll say, see also here, um, save for a few large tubes for egg deposits in the female's tank, the spaces are void of any kind of cognitive stimulus. At the beginning, we had nooks and crannies, parts of tubes or rocks for them, but little by little, we pulled them out as they realized we, they weren't needed. You know, if you've seen my octopus teacher, you know the lives that these animals lead. You know that this statement is concerning. Uh, so they're making the tanks more and more barren because they are supposedly uh, breeding octopuses who don't actually have any curiosity. So here's where the farm is supposed to go in Grand Canary. The farm currently is stalled. Um, last, I heard this week um, that the authorities have asked for um, more environmental permitting um, and more documentation. So this is kind of, again, we have this foot in the door that's about to close on this, and it's possible that the bureaucracy could help take over as a um, long-term form of, of stalling this. There was also a petition introduced federally in Canada um, in May this year. It got a bunch of, of signatures, the number it needed. Elizabeth May sponsored it, and she just presented it on um, October 5th. I have not heard um, how that went or what are the next stages for this bill, but it's a preemptive ban on both farming and um, I, and I believe also the import of, yeah, the importation of farm cephalopod products into Canada. So this would be federal, major federal legislation. In addition, some of you will have heard about the octopus farm in Hawaii. This is not octopus vulgaris and it's not even really a farm. It was, it's a ranch where they collect wild octopuses and then raise them in captivity, supposedly for food. Um, but in October 2021, 20, uh, um, Compassion World Farming had sent a letter to the governor about this farm. And then in December of 2022, Suzanne Rust at the LA Times, um, she published an article basically calling this farm out for being a roadside zoo. Um, it was having a lot of people come by um, from often cruise ships, fondle the octopuses. If you haven't read this article, and it has great visuals with them. And in January 2023, uh, the governor issued a cease and desist on that farm, um, which again is really more of a ranch than a farm. And now um, there is a representative in Hawaii who is planning to introduce precautionary legislation to the state, which is really exciting and fun to watch. And then I just want to end with something I also um, am tracking and really um, heartened by the precautionary legislation introduced in Washington state earlier this year. Um, and it went to the House Rules Committee. I was asked to um, potentially testify as an expert in this. I sat through the two hour state meeting um, in the Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee. I was amazed at how present animal agriculture was through that whole meeting. The issue of wolves really dominated the conversation there. And um, octopus were given one minute at the end. Nobody was able to testify. but. Positively, it actually passed through that first stage. And um, hopefully, and then in January or February, a committee member will pull the bill for full rules committee consideration, after which it could proceed to a full House um, of Representatives for the vote. So, um, Amanda Fox and Josh Diamond are the two lawyers in Washington leading the charge on this. And again, I'm really excited to see what they do and how this um, model legislation might be used in other states moving forward. Um, and that, that's, my, uh, that's my end slide. And what I am hoping for is um, between the, the kind of media and public outcry and the protests and then any precautionary legislation, because we're dealing with highly globalized markets that represent aquaculture, fisheries, and as we know, animal agriculture generally, that this will send a strong signal to, to capital, to the investors, 
um, to governments who subsidize this, this um, industry, that there is not a market here that, um, that we could try to, again, prevent this infrastructure from being built at all. Thank you. My name is Andres Jimenez Zorrilla. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of uh, Shrimp Welfare Project. We are a UK registered charity focused on improving the lives of billions of shrimps raised and uh, slaughtered for food. I want to thank the organizers of the conference for, for having me stationally, and I hope to make the case to all of you that it should be important for your work as well and, and hopefully inspire some of you to, um, to work in, in the areas that we uh, don't have covered, which are plenty. Um, so the very first thing, this is the presentation outline. If anyone wants to reach out to me after the, the presentation, feel free to do so. I love to talk shrimp. Um, so, and there will be, you'll see my email at the end of the presentation. So to dig right in, uh, what, what is it that we are concerned about um, when it comes to, to shrimp uh, farming? or shrimp raised for human consumption. The very first thing we get asked is, are shrimp sentient? This is obviously very relevant because if shrimps are not sentient, then there's no case for them to be moral patients and we can all go home uh, and rest uh, and um, uh, peacefully, uh, knowing that there's no suffering um, happening with the production of shrimps. Unfortunately, as you may have guessed, that is not the case. Um, I will um, go very quickly through this topic because there's a lot of it. It's complex, and I think if we're here, we largely acknowledge that we um, that we feel that they are. But if anyone is interested, the London School of Economics report prepared by Jonathan Birch and his colleagues in 2021, as part of the uh, a report that was commissioned by the UK government as part of the, its review of uh, their uh, animal welfare legislation has a great discussion of the um, sentience of the evidence of the sentience of cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans. And essentially the recommendation is an unrestricted, uh, an unrestricted recommendation that all cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans should be regarded as sentient and treated as such. There, um, this was uh, the basis for the, for these animals to be included in the UK uh, Welfare Act in 2022, in which the UK recognized the sentience of, of decapod crustaceans, of which shrimps are a part of. But this is not the only situation in which, um, or the only uh, jurisdictions in which they are regarded as sentient. The, uh, in the European Union, the European Food and Safety Authority back in 2005 had already said that the scientific evidence indicated that those animals are able to experience pain and distress and therefore should be protected. And there are other um, individual national legislations, such as Austria, Switzerland, Norway, et cetera, that already recognize the sentience of animals. The UK is just the latest of a number of, um, of, of countries recognizing the, their sentience. Now, this is very important in that this means that they're moral patients, but if, you know, if they were all raised in fantastic conditions and, and living net positive lives, then this should not be a problem. And because, you know, the more shrimps there are, the more happiness in the world we would have. Again, unfortunately, that is not the case, as, as you would expect. And as, as we know, with, with essentially every single animal raised for... Um, uh, for human consumption. And the things that we organizationally care most about are water quality. Water is extremely important for aquatic animals, as you can imagine, because this is the medium in which they need to survive and thrive. And water needs to meet certain very specific parameters depending on the species so that they can you know, um, go about their lives as, as they would and, and, and essentially um, have a a life worth living and this includes having enough oxygen 
having the pH level of the of the water in its certain very narrow ranges so that it's not very acidic or uh, or or otherwise um, temperature salinity etc there are many things and if that is not if all those are not right it can lead to asphyxia um, poisoning or very high levels of um, uh, or uh, compromised immune systems that then lead to disease and mass mortality events etc so water quality is essential to get it right then stocking density um this picture here and this video that i'm showing is not it's clearly not a pond where animals are being raised but what i'm trying to show is that crowdedness prevents animals from expressing their natural behaviors which essentially means that they they like to bor borrow uh, and and be depending on the species but be largely left alone and, and that does not allow them to do so. In, in many situations, they actually need to swim to, to and occupy the whole water column or the whole volume of the water, which they don't like. They prefer to be on the water. Um, sorry, they, they prefer to be on the bottom. And this also has a knock-on effect on water quality because the more animals you have, the more respiration, the more excretion, et cetera, et cetera, that has a negative uh, impact on water quality and then therefore the, the issues that we just discussed in the previous slide. Um, there's also the issue of um, slaughter. Typically, today, the industry would claim that most shrimps are immersed in ice slurry, which is icy water, uh, to render them unconscious. There's growing evidence that um, immerse, uh, immersing an animal such as a shrimp in ice slurry, what it does is it, it, it renders them immobile, but not unconscious, and could even prolong suffering by reducing the metabolic rate, and therefore this animal is taking longer to die. This is something that needs to be changed. In many other places, they're not even put in, in ice, and they're just left in crates like the ones you see on the top right-hand corner. Um, where they die from asphyxia or from being crushed under the weight of the of the other animals on top of them. Um, so this is a very, very concerning part of the whole uh, cycle of production of shrimps. And finally, these are very graphic images. So for the faint hearted who don't want to see them, feel free to look away for a moment. But I thought it was important to show that this, this is an industry video where they're showing without any uh, uh, reservations how they cut like, burn the eyes of of female shrimps to induce them going into a sort of um i'm sorry i'm going to stop the video a a sort of um reproductive overdrive and they start um, producing um, eggs this is done as you can see without any anesthesia this is probably as 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 well as it can be done um, but this can be by crushing the eyes etc so the, all of these terrible practices are clearly um, negative for the for the welfare of the animals and and can and should be eliminated or, or changed the the other aspect of um, why we think this is very important to work on and why I would it's very clear that we do not have shrimp welfare so to speak covered as an organization and we urge many of you to consider finding ways in which you can uh, have a positive effect on on this issue is the scale um rethink priorities a think tank recently published a paper titled the animal uh, shrimp the animal most commonly used and killed for food production at any given moment, there are about 200, 230 billion shrimps alive on farms um, and around almost half a trillion farm shrimps being killed for human consumption every year. That is one half of a trillion shrimps farmed. That doesn't even include the tens of trillions of shrimps which are wild caught and sold for food or used to produce shrimp paste. And um, so the scale of the problem is gigantic. 
and it is highly neglected. There's only a handful of organizations who have looked at this issue in the past. And as far as we know, Shrimp Welfare Project is the single uh, organization looking exclusively at the issue of shrimp welfare, which, as I mentioned, given the fact that they're sentient and the numbers, there's clearly room for a whole lot more um, organizations trying to improve the, the, the welfare of these animals. There's notable, very valuable work being done already. Crustacean Compassion in the UK uh, were pivotal to getting um, shrimps rec and crustaceans recognized the sentience in the, in, in the UK. Compassion and World Farming in the past has done a few uh, very valuable things and, and some other organizations, Aquatic Life Institute. Um, but by and large, this is a highly neglected problem that um, would benefit from people like the, those in the audience working on it. And then finally, tractability. We were very concerned when we launched our organization that talking about shrimp welfare um, with industry players would be a non-starter. And that does not seem to be the case. It has become a very relevant topic alongside um, sustainability. And there are uh, significant changes that are happening um, as, as a result of the work of our, our organization and the others that I've mentioned. And, and clearly there's a whole lot more to, to change and improve still. What, have, uh, what has Shrimp Welfare Project focused on and what have we achieved? We have a few different areas in which we work. The first one is in India, we work with small holding farmers through the Sustainable Shrimp Farmers of India um, Association. This is a knowledge, knowledge sharing network for farmers in which we basically teach them basic welfare focused uh, improvements to their practices, which in turn we expect will lead to better welfare of the animals, but also better survival rates and et cetera, which is in the interest of, of the farmers themselves. Um, at the moment, this presentation is somewhat dated. At the moment, we've now, we feel that we have affected the lives of uh, around 4 million shrimps already through this intervention. In Vietnam, we are largely focusing on uh, disseminating knowledge um, through industry outlets around the um, need to eliminate ice stock ablation, the need to adjust stocking densities to the to what the ponds of the farmers can actually withstand to avoid mass mortalities, and we're having some traction there as well. Um, we also uh, coordinate significantly with other organizations who, um, sorry, that that work in aquatic animal welfare including the Euro, uh, Eurogroup for Animals and um, the Aquatic Life Institute and, and several others. We do research, primary and secondary. Many times what we feel, what we hear from industry when we're asking for an improvement um, to, to the practices, they would say, well, there's very little evidence that that actually leads to better welfare. Or, in, for example, that electrical stunning is better than just leaving the shrimps um, out in in out, out of the water, and, and that is clearly that makes absolutely no sense. And it um, we, we're trying to address that. We've um, we sometimes undertake the research ourselves, but more often than not, what we do is we find researchers who are. Uh, trained and well equipped to undertake the the this research engagements in the most rigorous ways, and we connect them to to funders, and we we expect that there will be significant um, new evidence of what constitutes higher welfare for shrimps in the coming months and and years as 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 we continue to do research, and finally, so far, our most impactful uh, program has been engaging with corporations in convincing them to start using electrical stunning um, as part of their slaughter process. So basically making sure that the animals are rendered unconscious um, Im immediately after being taken out of the water with an electrical stun so that they um, do not experience this acute suffering in the last few minutes or hours of their lives. And this has affected, we have signed agreements that will affect in expectation 
approximately 1.1 billion shrimps per annum. Uh, and we're, we're extremely proud of that. And this also leads to normalizing this practice uh, and empowering consumers, retailers, certifiers, and eventually policymakers to demand that uh, shrimps are effectively stunned prior to slaughter and, and not undergo the, the current uh, horrific uh, process of, of, uh, of slaughter that they're subjected to at the moment. The main challenges that we face um, frequently unsupported le legal frameworks. There's, as, as I mentioned, there are some countries that have recognized the sentience of animals and who, uh, of these animals and, and which require, require certain standards or the production of shrimps in their countries. But there are a handful of countries at best. Frequently, they do, do not capture imports, which um, shrimps are largely produced in South, Southeast Asia and Latin America and largely exported to Europe, Japan, and the US. Uh, so import um, or trade legislation that includes welfare would be extremely valuable. And it's today non-existent, at least for shrimp. Very limited consumer awareness and, and kind of empathy. Very wide ranging production systems. So it's difficult to have a one, a single recommendation solution for all. An intensification process, the, the industry is trying to produce more animals per area of land, uh, which will mean more crowdedness, more number of animals. And finally, it's very hard to intervene in countries that do not have a link to, to, um, to countries that are, have welfare favorable uh, views. So it's easier to have a producer that sells into the UK market because the UK and, and get them to change a practice because the UK market or the UK consumer really cares about the welfare of their shrimps. But if there's a country that is not exporting to Europe or to, to a country that really cares about animal welfare, then it's hard to make a business case. So that, that will require more legislative uh, change. How can you get involved? There's a number of things. You can reach out to me, we'll compound ideas. You can also sign up to our newsletter. You can donate to, to, uh, to support our work, uh, but you can also inform yourself with all these resources that we have here. Um, this is a really big problem. We're a small organization. We're very proud of the work that we've done so far and our achievements, but there's so much more than that can and should be, should be done to improve the, the lives of, of shrimps worldwide. Uh, again, thank you very much, the, the organizers and, and uh, the audience for bearing with me. And here you can see my email. Uh, feel free to, to reach out to me. And um, thank you. Great. Thank you so much to everybody for uh, speaking at this event, for attending this event, to the organizers for organizing the event. I want to do a quick check to make sure people can hear me, if maybe people can give a thumbs up in the chat or the, the participants list. OK, great. So my name is Jeff Sebo, and I am thrilled to be a part of this panel. I love all of the, the talks that came before this one. All of these topics about invertebrates, octopuses, and insects, and shrimps are, are very dear to my heart. So thank you, everybody, to, for speaking to those issues. My role on this panel is to talk about how the use of AI is relevant to animal welfare and animal law. And so I want to focus on two general topics within that category. The first topic is about how the use of AI systems can affect non-human animals. And the second is about how the use of AI systems can affect the AI systems themselves. And in both cases, the question is, how can we use the tools of animal law to assess and address those issues? So I can briefly cover both and then draw a general conclusion. First, how does the use of AI systems affect non-human animals? Well, we know as a starting point that the use of AI systems is already having pervasive effects in society. And of course, some of these effects are good. AI systems can unlock new forms of creativity and productivity and wealth generation and can improve our lives in all kinds of ways, assuming all goes relatively well. But of course, they can also confront us with many risks and harms that we need to take very seriously including risks and harms that are happening right now. Garbage in, garbage out, 
amplifying racism and sexism and other oppressive attitudes and behaviors and displacing jobs and spreading misinformation and perhaps increasing inequality over time, perhaps leading to catastrophic threats in the future, including uh, the, the risk of nuclear war or global totalitarianism. So in light of these risks, people are rightly scrambling to develop AI ethics, AI safety, AI alignment policies so that if we do continue to develop AI systems, as it seems that we will, we can mitigate these risks as best we can. However, these policies are not in any way really at present taking into account non-human animals as stakeholders, but the use of AI systems can and will affect non-human animals too. And there are all kinds of examples about how. So for instance, chatbots, as with humans, can be prompted to express kindness or cruelty regarding non-human animals. They can be prompted to teach us about how to care for animals, as well as to teach us how to kill animals. They can be trained to use subject pronouns like they or object pronouns like it to describe animals. And it extends beyond chatbots too. For example, people are already developing uses of AI technology to allow us to explain and predict and control our impacts on captive and wild animal populations more effectively to monitor the effects of our activities on them and to control the effects of our activities on them. But this too can be used for both good and bad. It could be used to improve our ability to care for captive and wild animal populations at scale, but it can also be used to improve our ability to control them for our own purposes, to, to harm and kill them even more ruthlessly cost-effectively than we already do in industrial settings or for industrial purposes. And similarly, people are exploring the use of AI technology to facilitate communication between human and non-human animals, to translate our language for them and their language for us. So in the same way that I can go to a country where I might not know the language and I can use an app to interact with people there, we might one day be able to use an app so that we can understand what animals are telling us and so that we can communicate back to them. But this likewise can be used for good or for bad. We can use it to better understand their voices and their perspectives and to better represent them and accommodate them in decisions that affect them, but then we can also use it to manipulate them more effectively to express through their language that they should stay away from a territory that we might want to appropriate for our own purposes. So in all of these cases, this is a kind of dual use technology for both human and non-human animals. It can confer many benefits, but it can also create many risks and harms. And so the question is, as people for better or worse scale up these technologies, and as we scramble to develop AI ethics and safety and alignment policies, both internally at AI labs and externally in governments, what can we do to consider the interests and the rights of human and non-human animals as stakeholders so that we can increase the probability that AI systems will be developed and deployed in a way that can be safe for all of those stakeholders, humans and non-humans alike? That is the first question. But then the second question concerns how the use of AI systems might affect the AI systems themselves. And here is a place where animal law can be relevant because we have learned the hard way that we have a tendency to exploit and exterminate vulnerable populations in ways that can contribute to global threats that imperil us and them. And we might be able to apply those lessons to the increasing use of AI systems. So in particular, think about our history of and the current state of our interactions with non-human animals. As the other speakers have noted, we at present harm and kill quadrillions of non-human animals per year, especially if you account invertebrates like insects and shrimps, quadrillions of non-human animals per year in ways that not only are bad for those individual animals, but also contribute to global threats like pandemics and climate change. And then those global threats like pandemics and climate change imperil us all, humans and non-humans alike. And so a lesson that we are still as a species in the process of learning is that we have a responsibility for our sakes and theirs to reduce our use of non-human animals as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts 
and increase our support for non-human animals as part of our pandemic and climate change adaptation efforts. But then that requires extending basic forms of legal and political standing to them to facilitate improved treatment of them. So we need to use them less, we need to help them more, and we need to extend them basic standing and consideration as part of that. And that is tough to do when we have already built up global industrial industries that essentially involve their exploitation and extermination and have become socially and politically and economically deeply entangled in those industries. But now we are at risk of repeating all of those same mistakes with AI systems. So as we scale up the use of these AI systems, we are going to be deploying a vast number and wide range of digital minds and then using them for our purposes in a way where if they were sentient or otherwise significant, it could be very bad for them. Now, they might not be sentient or otherwise significant. I think the odds of that are right now very low, but they are becoming more sophisticated with each passing year. And our understanding of other minds is still very limited and we still have a lot of bias and ignorance about that. So in the near future, when we have AI systems who have advanced and integrated capacities for perception, learning, memory, self-awareness, social awareness, communication, reasoning, at least functional emotionality, the ability to detect positive and negative states, the ability to set and pursue goals in a self-directed manner, the ability to perform basic life functions that contribute to a kind of survival and reproduction or replication. At that point, when AI systems exist that have all of those capacities, and the only real difference between us and them is that we do that with carbon-based neurons and they do that with silicon-based neurons, then, at least in my view, there will be, if not a certainty, that they have morally significant features like sentience, at least a non-negligible chance that they have morally significant features like sentience. But when they are at that point, if we have taken the same trajectory that we took with non-human animals, we could, might have built a global set of industries surrounding their exploitation and extermination. And we might have become socially and politically and economically entrenched in those industries in the same way that we did with non-human animals. And then those interactions with AI systems might once again contribute to global health and environmental threats. Again, the threat of nuclear war, the threat of global totalitarianism that will imperil us all, humans, non-human animals, and AI systems. And so we might once again have to learn this lesson that for both our sakes and theirs, we need to reduce our use of them and increase our support for them and extend basic forms of legal and political standing to them to facilitate that process. And so my hope is that as we continue to work to advance human welfare and rights, as we continue to work to advance non-human animal welfare and rights, that we can learn a little bit from what we have done wrong with members of our own species and members of other species, and we can hopefully prevent ourselves from going down the same road with AI systems who might one day merit the status of vulnerable populations to whom we have some moral and legal and political duties. Because as other speakers in this session have noted, it is much harder to dismantle a global industrial system that already exists and with which we are already deeply entangled than it is to prevent such a system from taking off in the first place. This is why we should stop octopus farming before it starts. This is why we should stop insect farming before it starts or at least scales up globally. And this is why I think we should think seriously about how our use of AI systems will not only affect humans and other animals, but also how it will affect AI systems themselves so that we can work towards a holistic set of policies, a holistic approach to AI ethics and safety and alignment that can consider the potential impacts on all actually or potentially vulnerable populations. And that includes beings about whose sentience we are relatively confident, like humans and the other vertebrates, as well as beings about whose sentience we are 
a little bit less confident, but still think that there is a non-negligible chance. And that includes many invertebrates like the decapod uh, crustaceans, like the insects, and in the future, like certain advanced AI systems, I would suggest. So this is a way that animal law can be relevant. We can use animal law uh, to get out ahead of these issues and think about, again, how AI labs can internally and how governments can externally develop regulations that can assess and address these issues in a holistic, structural, and effective way. Thank you. Uh, thanks to my co-panelists for those uh, wonderful presentations. And we'll now turn to questions from the audience. Um, so if you have a question and are here in person, please uh, line up behind one of the two mics at the front of the room. And for those uh, joining us virtually, uh, please submit your questions via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Hi, thank you everyone so much. So, um, you know, as a species, we know so little. Um, I think that's especially true with the sea and with insect life. And, you know, human intervention and adoration can sometimes, and often is really bad for species, like, you know, like through finding Nemo or through, taking monarch caterpillars and rearing them indoors. So how do we encourage awe and respect for like charismatic mini fauna without like the continued exploitation and using them as means to an end? So is that through like dystopic AI? You know, we don't want to encourage more octopuses petting farms or more scientific studies. So that's, that's kind of my question is how do we do this in a way like explore this new terrain and encourage people to like them without doing that? Um. And I think that question could be answered by all of our panelists, but maybe Jennifer, if you want to speak to it, and then I'll turn to our virtual. Yeah, I mean, thank you for the question. I think it's really appropriate, especially for octopus vulgaris, because you have this fascination. You have the first glimpse now at its wild existence. You had people loving the videos in captivity of Escape, Cy Montgomery's book about those were all captive octopuses. And then they see them in the wild, in their native habitat, and it's even more compelling, right? And this is what people are really want. Um, but then, you know, let's say they, um, this came up in, in our class, Sophia's in my class at, at the University of Miami, um, somebody at, in Hawaii, you know, if they didn't encounter an octopus on uh, a scuba dive, they would be encouraged to go to the octopus farm so that they could have an interaction, right? Um, because that's what that's what we as humans crave, um, apparently alongside eating them. And so um, it, it's a great question. It feels like a really salient, perfect kind of question for architects, um, the future of zoos, the future of the sequarium where Toki was kept, you know, could it be a wildlife rehabilitation center instead? What kind of relationships do we want to encourage? Um, and it's clear that um, the, the captive setting isn't serving the animals well. And so we have to reimagine what those interactions would look like, where they would be healthy. But the, the thing that um, when we was, I was just teaching this material that the students and I were sort of grappling with was still would we prefer the roadside zoo model for octopuses over mass production factory farming? Do we make these choices? You know, there's um, the reason that came up is also because there's this tourism opportunity to swim with ranched tuna in Australia. And, you know, there you can be in the water with tuna swirling all around you. They promise they will never be killed for food. Um, it raised a lot of objections. And yet the industry is operating just, uh, you know, a little ways away. And I, I sort of wonder, like, what is what's if you're going to be making money off of an animal which is the better form um so i think these are all really important questions that deserve a lot of a lot of prying into especially when you start talking about oh well what, what about the scale of of um, the production as commodities and i think uh, the other thing that that we talked about that i think is important to note is a lot of what happens gets written off as well it's food and we have to eat and that argument is really passe. I mean, this is not about having to eat, right? These are really, so many of these animal uh, factory farms are about luxury production. And so how is that so different than the luxury consumption of interactions at a roadside zoo? I don't see that as being hugely distinguishable. Thanks. 
Um, and I'll just speak with respect to, to insects really quickly. Um, you know, one of the things that Germany is doing, as I mentioned, is requiring educational campaigns at all levels of, of education and society. So we're talking elementary school, middle school, adult education, and, you know, encouraging the development of, you know, backyard farming. And when we think about the animals who are closest to us, we often think of, you know, cats and dogs, um, those animals who are in our home, but insects are in our homes as well, and they're in our, in our literal backyards. And, you know, the more we can appreciate you know, our relationship with them and be encouraged to do so, I think the more sort of compassion that um, that we can develop for all other forms of non-human animal life. And, you know, again, that, that relationship is so easy and it's always around us. Um, and I think, again, will help us appreciate more, you know, right now um, on all of our bodies, there are demodex mites, you know, in our pores and they come out, you know, on our faces, at night when we sleep and they have sex on our faces and, you know, but that's just part of our, you know, they are part of our existence. They are part of our biome and it's a story of ourselves. And that can be really compelling and make us think more deeply again about all of this amazing life around us as Ed was speaking to um, last night. And um, I don't know, uh, Jeff and Andres. I think those are great answers. I have all sorts of things I could add, but I also want to make sure we have time for another question. So I'm happy to pass. Same here. Okay. Um, Chris? I'm very glad I washed my face this morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is questions for Andres. Uh, this is Chris Green. Um, we both participated in the Rethink Priority Strategy Forum this summer, and I was really blown away by this approach that you developed where Shrimp Welfare Project themselves we're purchasing these uh, electrical setting devices and offering them for free to these shrimp producers um, and removing any final argument they would have to implement them. Like, well, we'll just give it to you for free. And if they would then not accept them, you then would put pressure on retailers who would put down pressure on the producers to adopt them. And I think it was the first time I'd ever encountered uh, an animal protection organization actually themselves acquiring devices that would kill animals but doing so was exactly the right strategy to encourage the adoption of this practice that would reduce an incredible amount of suffering. So I'm sure that wasn't a decision you guys made easily. And so I'd be really curious to hear kind of what your thought process was of engaging in that because it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Chris, thanks a lot for the question. That's, um, I really appreciate it. Um, you're right, we are doing something that is um, somewhat out there. And the reason why we decided to do it was we 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 witnessed several harvests which is the slaughter events of shrimps where you can see hundreds of thousands of shrimps dying in an hour and and they were dying by just being left out um out of the water suffocating crushing each other and we when we started looking at how we could improve that we realized that the technology to render shrimps unconscious existed and it and had existed for a number of years, two or three years. Um, it was being used already by one producer in Vietnam. This producer enjoyed favorable market conditions by their from, from their buyers, but for some reason there was this impasse where that even though the technology existed, um, there was no adoption by, by industry at all. Um, and, and, and we felt that it was, you know, really unfortunate. We, we tried speaking to retailers to say, you should solve this issue. And they would tell us no, because it is impossible for my supplier to use it because the conditions of their pools in which their ponds in which they produce shrimps are so specific because they don't have electricity because they have a super intensive system because their roads are x y z all these excuses that we decided the best that we can do is to just get rid of all of these excuses so we've we've signed agreements with people in ecuador in vietnam in honduras there will be stunners being used in intensive systems super intensive electrified farms um, farms using generators and this will allow us to 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 tell retailers and baby consumers to empower them to say you can demand this new uh, more humane way of slaughtering hundreds of billions of shrimps 
And there's no reason why you should be told that that's impossible. And that's kind of the theory of change, proving that this can be done, that it is not impossible, that it is safe for workers, and all of the excuses that have been posed by the industry can be removed. Um, and, and just move this over to a window for uh, um, certifiers to demand it, retailers to uh, exclude uh, producers who are not using this more humane approach and eventually for policymakers when there's a review for example of the european um, welfare policy that that relates to shrimps in 2028 that they can um, see including electrical stunning as something that's feasible that they're not asking the industry to do something unreasonable because it will have been proven uh, by our program so that's kind of the theory of change of what we're doing uh, i hope that explains why we why we decided to do this Thank you, Andres. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, and I know some other folks had questions, but please feel free to, uh, with respect to our virtual panelists, um, you know, please contact them if you have questions, or for uh, myself or Jennifer, please um, feel free to come up to us um, after uh, this panel. Um, but I just want to, um, uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for their great presentations.